Who is Jesus? This question is one most of us have faced. And could the answer to this question change everything? Was he just a prophet? A good teacher? An ordinary man? God. The answer to this question will change everything. Basically walking through the book of John to the seven parts of which Jesus uh, talks about and uses the phrase I am and then describes himself. He says uh, two weeks ago, I am the light of the world. And we talked about how the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ reveals who we are, who he is, and whom we are meant to be. Last week we dove into the idea that Jesus says I am the bread of life And that Jesus not only gives us the means in which to live, but his life itself is the meaning of why we are here. And this week we're gonna talk about when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Um, Now, the thing is, as I was studying this last week for this sermon, uh, and I've heard the sermon preached many a times, when he talks about the good shepherd, he's gonna talk about sheep. And then ultimately, uh, I've read and, and, and some commentaries, and I've read through and listened to some other sermons, some other pastors, and it's like they take the opportunity to talk about the sheep. They take the opportunity to talk about how we are all sheep and how we're all essentially just dumb and we need a shepherd, okay? I don't know if these pastors are just trying to get out some angst against their congregations, I'm not really sure, Uh, but the reality is that chapter 10, if we're really being true to the text, doesn't have anything to do really with the sheep or the waywardness of the sheep has everything with how good the shepherd is. And so that's what we're gonna focus on. Now I have had sheep. I confidently, because I'm really excited about the good shepherd because I can say I have owned sheep and they're not smart animals. I'll be very honest, they aren't. But it's not the comparison we're gonna go to. I mean, I had one sheep. It's funny though, I had one sheep that he would like, literally was a ram, and he would literally eat all the grass around him, and yet didn't realize he could go 10 more feet the other way and get more grass. We literally had to like show him where the grass was, yet for somehow I could put him in his pen and he'd get out every single time like some sheep ninja. So I'm not really sure. I think like I called him dumb one time out in the pasture, he was like, I'll show you, you watch this. Cassie can attest to you many times when we lived in Portland, we had a five acre ranch, I'd be running around in my pajamas and work boots trying to chase sheep out of my neighbor's yard. It was awesome and amazing and I think the whole neighborhood got a good laugh out of it, seriously, it was great. So, and I, every time I'm chasing the sheep, it's funny, I'm thinking there's gotta be a sermon illustration example, God's trying to speak to me here and then when I finally catch the sheep, I'm like, nope, these sheep are just dumb. When the deacons came and a lot of other people came to move us, I got to know Gary Sherman really well. I just met him for five minutes, but it's amazing when you're wrestling a sheep down after chasing them for an hour and five acres and you're on top of each other, you just get, you bond, you get close to one another. The sheep dung and smell in your nostrils, nothing like builds friendship like sheep dung. Anyway, I don't know where that's going. Here we go. So, but it's not about the sheep, it's about how good the shepherd is. And so we're gonna dive right in. John chapter 10, you can go ahead and turn there. We're starting in verse seven. Uh, it may say something a little bit different up here. Yes, it's John one, it's actually be John 10. John chapter 10, starting in verse seven. Now let me set this up for you a little bit. Jesus has just healed a blind man. Just previously before this text, he healed a man who was blind, and the blind man was then confronted by Pharisees, and for those who don't know who Pharisees are, the religious leaders of the day, the religious elite, the pastors, if you will, the gatekeepers of God in his Old Testament, and his word, and his law, and they were questioning this man, and the man's like pretty much like, look, I don't know if he's the son of God or not, but he healed me, and I believe. That's what he's pretty much saying. And then Jesus turns around and says, look, you guys are all blind. You're religious blind people is what he's talking about. You can't even see when the Messiah is before you when God has come to this earth embodied in me. And so he starts going into this tirade about kind of like I am the good shepherd and he's talking to them as he's, he's approaching them more or less as, as, as ancestral Jews, as people who understand the Old Testament and understand that God is bringing a Messiah. But all these people felt like that the God that would bring the Messiah, the one that they had been worshiping for all these years, but they had lost their way and got so wrapped up in religious meanderings that they based their hope in their own works and not on God. They believed he would send the Messiah, a conquering hero, a political uh, overlord, someone who would overthrow the Roman government and bring forth a great army of Israel. But Messiah, the Jesus, the promised in the Bible came to be the good shepherd in order that they may find life. And so Jesus is talking to them here and he goes into starting verse seven. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, 
I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, if, if you're a person who marks in their Bible, if you underline your Bible, uh, even if it's to show your neighbor how righteous and spiritual you are, I want you to underline, it's okay, it's a safe place. It's a safe place. Verse 10 right there, that is the key of this whole entire passage, this text. We wanna go right to the good shepherd, and it's a great, it's a great line. Jesus says, in a great truth, I am the good shepherd, and I lay my life down for the sheep. But the real crux of this verse, this whole passage, is that I've come to give you life, not just life, but life abundantly. Now the problem with this, and the idea of life abundantly, and what Jesus is meaning, is that we have been kind of steered the wrong direction sometimes of what that actually means in our lives. Abundant life in Christ. I'm Unfortunately, there has been a movement in the last several years where there's a certain theology, and I even hesitate to even call it that, this mentality that if you believe in Jesus, that abundant life that you're going to get, that he's gonna give you, is not just a relationship with God, but a new house and a new home, and you'll be healthy and wealthy and wise for the rest of your days. You'll never encounter anything that's struggling or any kind of things, and there's a problem with that. It's called life in the Bible. That's why that doesn't work out. When you and I met Jesus, we realized our lives didn't instantly get better. They just became internal and joyous and happy. And we had a relationship now with God to get through the difficult times. But Jesus does not promise us to have our happiness be dictated and founded in things we find here on this earth. The abundant life in which we live is an abundant life that Christ has died for. And he didn't die for you to have the new Mercedes. I mean, just straight with you. But unfortunately, we've twisted these verses, we've, and there's a whole, I mean, you turn on the TV and you can see a lot of this happening, but it's, we take this verse, or Jeremiah 29, 11, for I have the plans for you, says the Lord, and plans to prosper. And he's like, okay, that's it. God wants me to go and have this relationship. God wants me to have this job. God needs me to have this so I can be happy. No, no, brother and sister in Christ, you are happy because you know Jesus. That abundant life in Christ will get you through the most difficult of times. That abundant life in Christ, the reality that he has died for your sins. And can we even just step back for a minute and fathom that? That God looked down from heaven and he sent his son Jesus, perfect in every single way, fully God and fully man, to die for people who did not deserve it. When Jesus says, I've come to give you life, he's not just talking to them. He's talking about the abundant life you and I can have right now. But would we just... Would we just put that in such a corner that we would limit God and limit Jesus to have that abundant life of, of baubles and trinkets that we can gather here on this earth instead of an eternal feeling of love and sacrifice and relationship with God Almighty? But we do that sometimes, and unfortunately there's a whole theology that's been built upon this idea that if you love Jesus, then you're gonna be healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'll be honest with you, I love Jesus, but I still have bills to pay, I still have struggles, I still have things. Look, I messed up today already. You did too, I bet you. I'm not talking about this week, I'm not talking about this month, I'm about today, before you got to church, you probably already messed up. That person you looked at differently when you were driving on the road to cut you off, that you said something that wasn't a prayer under your breath. That child you encountered this morning who decided at 5.30 is a great way to end spring break. No, okay, just talking for a friend then. 5.45, my son comes up, I was like, what are you doing? He's like, what? It's time for church. And when you say that, you can't say anything bad about somebody. Get back to bed. It's not time for church. I mean, what are you going to say? Anyway, we've messed up. I've messed up. Maybe I should have encountered that differently. Maybe I should have approached that differently. Maybe I should have prayed for that person. Despite me messing up, when Jesus is with me, he gives me abundant life, and God sees me as a spotless son of God. That's the abundant life in which we are sinners, and we deserve death, but we get righteousness. We deserve to not live, but God gives us life. So your abundant life, your life in Christ is gonna get you through the most difficult times, not the things that you acquire here on this earth. Not that your kids are gonna work out. Not that your relationship is gonna get better. 
Not that you're gonna get that job or you're gonna defeat that cancer or whatever the case may be. That is not where life, an abundant life lives. It's in with Jesus knowing that this earth is just temporary and we are gonna be one day on the throne room of God celebrating all that he's done for us and worshiping for all the things he's done and that we can live with there's no more tears and no more sin and no more death and no more sickness. We don't have to take an offering anymore because the people of God will be there already hand in hand, arm in arm, praising of what he did on this earth. That, my friends, is abundant life and you can't find that in anything you can purchase. You can't find that in a relationship you cultivate. You can't find that in having perfect children to do exactly what you want them to do. I'm coming from experiences last week. We've had a rough time with one of our kids. And to be honest with you, I'm just like, God, why won't you do something? But I can't find life in that situation working out. I can only find life and abundantly in Christ because all the things that are here on this earth are fickle and broken and are not worthy to give me abundant life and have never meant to be. Your job security, anything that you can point to that says that gives me life, you're trying to place that above Jesus and Jesus. He says, look, I didn't come just to give you life. I came to give you abundant life. Now I gotta take a breath. That was a lot. <clears throat> All right. New people here today are like, is he always like this? And everybody, and, 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 and the east side people said? Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Hey, they get what they pay for. <laughs> Let's go back to the text. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Okay, here's the thing. I wanna talk about this real soon. Jesus is, hear this, if you leave with nothing else today, Jesus is the path to abundant life. He pays the cost to abundant life and he maintains our abundant life. And we'll get to all these, all right? But here he's talking about him being the path to abundant life. He says, and I wish we had time to do this in scripture. I actually thought about just preaching this one verse a whole sermon saying, I am the door, I love it. But we'll touch upon this more whenever we hit, when Jesus says in a couple of weeks, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But for now, he says, I am the door, I am the pathway. Now, why is it significant he speaks this to this particular audience is because they are Jewish, they are Pharisees, they are Sadducees, they are religious leaders who intercede on behalf of the people to God. They are the gatekeepers to who gets to come to the temple, who gets to come to God. They are the ones who hold the law and teach the law. They're the ones who are the right, supposed to be the righteous examples, become self-righteous, unfortunately. They are the gatekeepers and Jesus says an astounding thing, says you're not the door, I'm the door. I'm the path, I'm the way. I am the door and the sheep will enter in by me and I will take them to pasture. What Psalm does that remind you of? Psalm 23, right, we love it. And he lays me down by green pastures. He says, I am rest. I am hope. I am the way to abundant life. He said, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture." Christ, and hear me say this, in an exclusive, what we call an exclusive truth, Jesus is the only way to salvation. Well, of course, Kyle. Okay, hold on. Now, you may not believe that whatever other false God out there that isn't the way, you're like, yeah, yeah, I don't subscribe to Islam or Buddha or whatever the case may be, whatever world religion you wanna pull out there, yeah, but do you sometimes subscribe to you as a personal savior? Do you make yourself your functional savior? Do you try to get yourself out of situations? Look, I'm not trying to call you out. I'm confessing right now that even as far as this last week, I've tried to make myself the solver of my problems. I've tried to make myself Messiah over my life. I've tried to make myself the author of my abundant life and I've come quickly to the recognition that Jesus is the only path in which we can find abundant life. He is the door. But we wanna wade in those waters, don't we? We wanna wade in those waters and those circumstances. Now hear me, it's not that God doesn't care about your circumstances, he does, he does. But our hope is not founded in our circumstances working out, it's that there is no death for Jesus, that resurrection did occur, and that we have a relationship with Christ forever. He says, I am the door. 
If anyone enters by me, anyone, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but anyone who enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes and steals and kills and destroys. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. When he talks about the thief to come and kill and destroy, he's talking about the devil. He's talking about sin and death, which reigns supreme over the earth until Christ comes. And he says, no longer I will crush sin and death forever, as was predicted in Genesis 3, when God told Eve, and one day your seed will come and crush the head of the serpent. He's though therefore, Jesus comes and crushes sin and death once for all. He says, I am the path. I'm coming to give you life abundantly. The thief you can point out. That's what he's pretty much saying there. You can recognize the difference. There's a vast difference between when we sin and we feel like things have been taken from us. Even your pet sin. Even that one sin that you go to for comfort, that anger that bursts out that makes you just feel better to get it out, right? That gossiping that makes you feel like you're connected to people, that addiction that numbs you to whatever problems that you're going to have, those sins, that sin, that life that is not through the door, that is not what Jesus wants for you, it steals from you, it takes from you. Even after you're done committing that sin, you don't feel fulfilled, you feel empty. And he's saying, look, he comes and he comes to steal and destroy, not me, I come to give life, life abundantly. That's how you can know I'm in it. That's how you can pick me out of the crowd in your life is that what I give you brings you life and life abundantly. Jesus is the path to abundant life. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Look, I, I, and this sounds like false humility, it's not. I'm not a fancy preacher. I don't, I don't know how to look at a text and craft three things that rhyme with each other and make you turn away going, I remember that. I remember that. I'll remember that for the rest of my day. That one sermon that Kyle preached on that, you know, April 2nd, 2017 will be in my life forever. I, I just don't have the ability, but I own it. Like I know that. That's okay. Okay with it. All I know is this, that when I read that verse, all I see is the gospel. That's all I see. I am the good shepherd. A lot of times pastors are called shepherds. We're referred to as shepherds of people who are shepherding over the flock of God, the church in which he gave us. We are the under shepherds. He is the good shepherd. Jesus is the lead pastor of Eastside Baptist Church, just FYI. If you were wondering, we should just have on our website a staff page, pastor, Jesus Christ. I mean, because we're just fickle, finite beings who are doing our best to discern what God has for us in this place, but he is the shepherd. He is the lead pastor, and we all, as we just say, every knee will bow to the lion and the lamb. He's the over-shepherd, and as a good shepherd does, he lie, lays his life down for his people, for his sheep. Can we step back for me for just a minute and think through that? Look, look, think of your sin right now, the sin you committed today, this week, or whatever. It's not hard, is it? It comes to our hearts right away. And yet, despite that sin, Jesus came, knowing we were gonna be sinners. And he came and he lived a perfect life in every way. He was righteousness beheld in flesh. He was tempted in the ways we were tempted, yet he did not sin. And when he went to die on a cross, it was the death that you and I deserve. And he absorbed our sin. And I want you to catch this picturesque moment on the cross because this is what it is in. I give my life, lay down his life for the sheep. The thing is, the cross is not something to turn away from, but to gaze upon because in it we find hope. Jesus did not just take upon your sin like he took your sin and put him on your shoulders or he's bearing your sin. We say a lot. No, he absorbed your sin. He became sin who knew no sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. That's what your Messiah did. That's what the path did, the door into the green pasture that leads us to this abundant life. Yet we did not deserve, the Bible even tells us in Romans chapter eight, we were enemies of God. Enemies, think of your enemy. Think of someone that has hurt you. Could you imagine giving your life up for that person? That's exactly what God did with Jesus. That's exactly what he did. We can't confine and confound and even understand and bend to fathom what the abundant life Jesus gives because of the great love in which he had for us and taking the death and the nails in which we deserved and his blood reigns red so that we may be washed clean by it. That alone gives us abundant life. Today is, um, 
is the official first day of Autism Awareness Month. Um, I know some of you have children who have autism or are on the spectrum. My uh, oldest biological kid's on the spectrum. And, um, you know, I remember sitting um, in a child psychologist in Oklahoma and listening to her talk about the possible realities Cassie and I faced um, is that, you know, he has autism. And that's all that it, and, I, and it took me so long to really recognize that and to come to grips with that. But he says he may not talk because at the time he wasn't verbal. He said he may not, and he just listed all these things he might not do. And we were kind of grasping the reality that he probably won't have friends and that he probably, you know, he's gonna be socially not be able to, uh, you know, integrate with people. And he may not ever speak and take care of himself or whatever. And so we had to grasp that reality. And I'll be honest, my gut reaction was, but that's where my hope is lying, that my son, my oldest son, and dads, you know this, right? It's your oldest boy, right? I mean, everybody believes he's gonna be playing for the University of Oregon quarterback, yeah? I mean, I mean, slightly, a little bit, a little bit. Unless you have my genetics when you know there's no hope there. I had false hope in that. But you put all your life into this child and you think this is it, this is why I'm here. And to be told that he has a disease in which he can't conquer. Have you met Noah today? 11 years old, he can go to the bathroom by himself, amen. <laughs> has a best friend now in school named Tanner. loves Jesus and at, just last night at dinner we were all sitting around the table and I said Noah you want to pray and Cassie gives me this look like okay you asked for it because it's a sermon <laughs> apple tree okay yeah and he prays the sweetest prayers he prays for his adopted sister he prays for his adopted brothers he prays for all of us, a kid who could not speak until the age of three and a half, four, sitting there praying to God. But don't miss this. It's not that God gave us that blessing and allowed that to happen that gives us life. If Noah was to never speak, never leave our home, never have a best friend, never be able to function in society, we would still have abundant life in Christ. That doesn't diminish it. My point is this, friends. The good shepherd laid down his life for us so that we may not just have life, but have it abundantly. Anything else over that is just icing on this thing we call life. That's all it is. It's just extra grace upon grace to what we've already been shown that despite that we are sinners, Christ died for us. Let's keep going. <coughs> He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me, I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus paves the way to abundant life. He also pays the cost for our abundant life and he also maintains us in abundant life. Shepherds kind of had a bad rap, to be very honest with you. It's interesting that pastors are called shepherds because shepherds back then were notorious scoundrels. I guess there's a correlation there. Um, the shepherds were low end educated, low income. Uh, they would be hired out by wealthy, wealthy landowners or people who had a lot of flocks and they would be hired out to go and take care of the sheep and they'd take them for days on end out to pasture to fatten them up and then bring them back to market. When they were out there with the sheep, oftentimes the sheep would have babies because the sheep were doing what sheep do and they had babies. Ask your parents. And you know, welcome mom and dad. <laughs> um, the thing is, then they would see the baby sheep and they would pick them up and, uh, and they wouldn't tell the owner about them. They would actually keep them and go to market themselves and that's kind of how they made money sometimes. And so to a point where there are certain cities, particularly Ephesus, you can actually bring a sheep if you're a shepherd to market because they would consider you probably stole it, all right? So this is what had happened. The shepherd, if it would be encountered with a predator, a wolf or a bear or something like that would come after a sheep. I don't know if bears eat sheep, that just came up, I don't know. But let's just say they do. Um, they would probably run because they don't own that. They don't own those sheep. They're just a hired gun. 
They're not gonna lose their life for something that is someone else's profit. Do you see what I'm saying? You tracking with me? Okay. Jesus is making this reference. He's like a hired hand would leave. A hired hand would look in the face of sin and of tragedy and of things that are trying to harm the sheep and he's, he's, he's jetting, man. He's gone. He's gone because they're not the good shepherd because I am the good shepherd. I maintain you in that abundant life. I protect you in that abundant life. When I have you, you're mine and you can't run away and nothing can get to you. And we step back and we just believe that Jesus is who he says he is. When we step back and we believe that our life that we live right now is solely because of Jesus Christ. We have abundant life. We have joy in the face of terrible circumstances. We have joy in the face of misery and hardships because we have one another and we have Jesus. That's abundant life, my friends. And yet he says, look, I will face, and he's pretty much saying, I have faced the wolf. I have faced sin and death and I will defeat it. I will crush the jawbone. I will crush the teeth. I will close the mouth of sin and death. It will not touch the sheep and I will lay down my life. I know my sheep and they know me. They hear my voice and they know my voice. Let me say this to you. And this is, I don't know where this is gonna go, but Jesus knows you. And I don't mean like corporately, which he does know you corporately, you're not just in his tribe, okay, in his group. You don't just have a name badge that says Christian and he's coming to you like some politician trying to go for re-election. Like, hey, how's it going? Byron, Byron, is it Byron? I can't remember if it's Byron. Okay, great, great, great. Jesus Christ, thanks for voting for me. Thanks for choosing me as your savior. Appreciate that. It's not Jesus doesn't just kind of apathetically know you. He doesn't know you because you happen to go to church. Oh, 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 here in heaven, there, there's one of my people. I didn't, I didn't know they were one of mine. I'm glad they're in church today. Jesus knows you. He was there when you were created. He and the Father have knit you together. He knows you. Everything. He knows how you messed up today. He knows the hardships you face tomorrow. Yet he does not flee. He does not leave you. He does not run away and leave you to your own devices. He is the good shepherd and he stands firm for his sheep as they graze in the pasture of his presence. He is the path, the door to abundant life. He paid the cost for that life and he maintains you in abundant life. He says, the good shepherd, I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay my knife down for the sheep. Jesus is again equating himself with God. When he says I know, he doesn't mean I know him like I've met God in heaven. I am God. And he had to be so that our sins could be removed. So he could be the perfect payment for the penalty of our sin. Verse 17, we're gonna we'll close it up here. Let's go to 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay my, down my life that I may take it up again. A few things, and then we'll, we'll close out for the day. Number one, Jesus says very clearly that there are some here that are not here that are of my fold. And they're gonna come to, unless you are a um, ethnic Jew from Israel right now, he's talking about you. If you are that, then welcome to Oregon. But if you're not, he's talking about you. He's speaking of you and I. Jesus is thinking of you. Long ago before you took your first breath, Jesus was thinking of you. And let me just say this too. A lot of people are going to be surprised when they get to heaven and look to their left and their right and to see who's worshiping God with them. This verse alone, let me just read it again to you because I think it's important. Verse 16. And he says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice and so there'll be one flock, one shepherd. Racism should never exist because of this verse. Intolerance should never exist because of this verse. Every creed, every ethnicity, every background, every ethnic and, and economic standings and 
situation and cultural diversity will bow before the lion and the lamb. The good shepherd has come not to save just Americans. He's come to save the world. There are now, statistically speaking, more Chinese missionaries coming out of China right now and going to Southeast Asia than there are in the United States. And I believe, and I'm not a prophet, I'm not prophetic, and I'm not claiming that, so don't hear me say this, it's not a prophecy, I don't, I don't, I don't have that gift, and, and that's a whole other sermon. But <laughs> I'm, I just have this feeling that we are gonna see an uprising of Christianity in the Middle East because the gospel moves and people are raised when the people are being oppressed. When the gospel is being oppressed, the gospel rises. And I believe we are about to see some amazing things coming out of the Middle East. And I'm telling you all this to say this, that your neighbors who look different, smell different, act different, talk different, vote differently, they deserve Jesus too. They need Jesus too. They're of the fold of what Jesus talked about was I claim and I call out and they hear me. They hear my voice and I know them and they know me. They are, he is the door for them. He pays the penalty for them and he will sustain them in that abundant life in which you and I enjoy. The special needs person, the orphan, the widow, all can lay their rest and their hope on Jesus. I'm off my soapbox now, thank you. Verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Christ is alluding to his resurrection. He's alluding to the day that will come in which he will die on a cross for you and I so that abundant life can start for those who would believe, yet death could not hold him in three days from that time he will rise as conqueror over sin and death, as the good shepherd who laid his life down yet picked it up again. And that, my friends, is why you and I have abundant life because we have a savior who is not dead but lives. He gives us this abundant life and it's life. It's not just sustaining thoughts or teachings or sayings. It's life, not death, life. So let me say this. There's a few of us out here this morning, I think these things may apply to you. Number one, some of you are literally listening to this going, I don't need that. And I'm always careful where my gaze lies because some of you think I'm pointing you out. I'm not. I'm just saying, some of you really believe in your heart you don't need this. I don't need a good shepherd for I am good. And I pray that God breaks you of that. I pray that God reveals to you that the things that you're building forth in your life that you think are bringing you peace and freedom and abundancy, I pray you understand that they will leave you empty in the end. What a terrible thing to pray for someone to be broken. I do, I pray for that. I pray that you're broken. I pray you break like I broke so many years ago when Jesus said, I did not die for you to live like this life that you're living, Kyle. I've got better plans for you, a life abundantly in my presence. As many people can attest here this morning, some as recent as just the last few months, and say, I have found life in Christ. I have found my life. I found all that sustains me in Jesus, and it has not come through my circumstances here on this earth. It comes through my relationship with Jesus. And so if that's you here this morning, and you say, I don't want that, I, I mean, I pray God breaks you, I do. Man, I know that's not really friendly of me to say, but... It's because I love you. Number two, some of you may have some thoughts saying, well, of course he died for me. Look at me. And you may not even be that arrogant, right? But in your heart, you're thinking, well, look at me. I've come to church, I'm a good person, pay my taxes, I'm nice to my spouse, good parent, go to work, don't cheat, don't lie, don't steal. No, I don't need a good shepherd. Of course he died for me. That attitude, my friends, is not abundant life. Because even in your own good works, you find self-righteousness. You find the idols, and you find yourself trying to be your functional Messiah in need of one who is much better. For the rest of us here, you may be walking with Jesus for a little while or for a long time. You have may known the good shepherd for quite some time now. But it's that last part I want you to hold on to Jesus doesn't save you and then throws you out. Good luck, we'll see you in heaven one day. 
he maintains your abundant life. So you can take the truth of the gospel, which is the essence of the abundant life in which we live, the essence in which we can barely get our brains around that Christ died for us though we were sinners, he gave us life, he gave life to those who were called enemies of God, that's what he did for you and I, and he maintains us. So tomorrow, whatever fear, whatever thing you are facing tomorrow, whatever whatever trial that waits for you on Monday that will keep you up on Sunday. Rest well, my friends, knowing that no matter what tomorrow brings, the outcome will never and can never steal your joy that you have in Christ. That's abundant life. Oh, should we just dismiss these things? No, because God knows you, right? Remember, Jesus knows you. You've heard his voice and he knows his sheep and he cares about your circumstances but he has already given you abundant life so that you can see those circumstances with the lenses of the gospel, not lenses of the flesh. So you can approach your circumstances and your trials as not one who does not have hope, as one who can mourn, but mourn with hope, as one who can look at their current situation and their future knowing that Jesus has come, lived, died, rose, and reigns. Well, Kyle, you don't understand my circumstance, but look, I, we could go all around the room about our troubles. We'd be here all day. But my job is not to give you answers. My job is to point you back to the one who does. To point you back to Jesus and say, yeah, I get it. I'm so sorry about what your struggles are. Look to Jesus. Look to the author of abundant life who is the path in which you go to abundant life. He paid the cost for your abundant life and he will sustain you till the very end. Let's pray. Father, I mean, we just believe in the gospel. That's all we preach here. That's all we proclaim. That's all we want people to believe. We're sinners. You knew that. We deserve death. You give us life in Jesus. Please give us the faith in which to believe that for the first time or for the hundredth time. Give us faith in which to believe that, Lord. Give us the abundant life that is not bound in our circumstances here on this earth, but is bound in heaven with you, Christ. Give us the abundant life in which we can look at our neighbor as people who need Jesus, as people who need help, those people who need love, May we not see the differences among us, but see all our need for Christ. Father, I pray if there's one person here this morning who needs to have their heart broken and remade in the image of Jesus, Father, will you do that? Will you take away their heart of stone and give them that heart of flesh so that they may believe? Give them the faith in which they lack to believe that there is a savior, a good shepherd who died for them. Them, not just everybody that believes, but them as well, the individual. And they can cling to that abundant life through their faith in Christ. And this we pray in his name, amen.